Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Direct Marketing to Institutions, a healthcare case study. My name is Demetrius Fassis and I'm the Montana Local Foods Program Specialist at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, more commonly known as NCAT. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization with six regional headquarters across the country. We work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture and renewable energy. Developed by NCAT, the Farm to Cafeteria Network is a group of Montana-based food processors, producers, food service professionals, and community members who all collaborate and share best practices and resources about Farm to Cafeteria programs across the state. The Farm to Cafeteria Network's mission is to support vibrant local communities by increasing the amount of healthy, locally grown food served in our public and private institutions. Next. Today's webinar is being funded in part by the Montana Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Grant Program and the Montana Healthcare Foundation. And we're very grateful for their partnership and support. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the day. Seth Bostic is an executive chef at, with Thomas Cuisine Management, working at Kalispell Regional Medical Center. Keith Graham is the owner and operator of Mountain View Gardens. And Scott Lester is a co-owner and operator of Whitefish Stage Farm. Next. During today's webinar, we'll hear from Seth about institutional expectations for food. Keith will talk about developing a successful mid-scale operation, including staffing and quality assurance. And Scott will detail marketing strategies that have been employed on their diversified farm. I will then give a brief overview of the Montana Harvest of the Month program as it relates to opportunities for producers, and the webinar will be followed with time for participants to ask questions of our presenters in a panel format. As you're listening to today's webinar, you can type in any questions that you might have in the question field that you see on your screen, and I will gather them up and sort them out, and we'll have our panelists answer as many as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Uh, while we may not be able to get to all the questions during the webinar, we will get back to you via email in the days to come. Also, before we begin, I just want to ask that you fill out a, a very brief survey at the end of the webinar so that we can continue to provide effective outreach and education to you. So thanks in advance for taking the time to do that. First off, I want to take a minute to add some fuel to the fire that brought you to this webinar and answer the question, why should we care about marketing to institutions? Here in Montana, Public institutions represent a largely untapped market for our producers, uh, with an estimated annual spending of $33 million on food each year. The vast majority of that money is leaving our state via massive broadline distributors. So some of the advantages to tapping into this market as a, as a local producer um, are engaging in fewer transactions with a larger volume, building long-term stable business relationships, um, you know, diversifying your market uh, and moving away from reliance on farmers markets and CSAs that have boom and bust periods. Uh, and it's also a good opportunity for marketing seconds as institutions are, are often um, processing these foods into dishes. Um, especially in, in Montana in particular, there are some local processing facilities like the Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center or Root Cellar Foods that create value added and, and frozen food that has year round availability um, for some of these local products. And, and also local is trending. Um, the lead food trends researcher at the Wolf Research Institute in, in New York, Scott Mushkin, uh, spelled out the new consumer research that he completed back in 2016 saying it's turning on its head the way we thought about food in the 1950s to the 1980s. Local and fresh is in. Processed is out. That trend has spread throughout every age and income bracket in just the last two years. Next. Um, with that, we need to spend a few minutes learning about the needs of the buyer, and Seth Bostic is here with us as the executive chef for Kalispell Regional Medical Center to explain the considerations that are important when developing a relationship with a hospital buyer. So take it away, Seth. Good afternoon. My name is Seth Bostic. I'm the executive chef with Thomas Cuisine Management, and I work in conjunction with Kalispell Regional Medical Center. Uh, right now, we're going to talk a little bit about some building some relationships. We'll first start off with about the best time to approach us in the hospitals and institutions. 
in the past in restaurants, uh, everything that we had done has always involved us being busy in the afternoons and evenings. But in healthcare, we're very busy in the mornings and very slow in the afternoons and evenings. So if you're trying to build a relationship or start a relationship with one of us in the hospital, school settings, or other institutions, what we're looking to do is have you kind of come in and see us anytime after around 1 p.m. to 3 or 4 p.m. in between our uh, lunch and uh, dinner services because we have the most time that we can sit down on the table and look at the products, look at the pricing, and uh, discuss what sort of insurance liabilities that might be in our way. Um, and in which case, we would look at doing some advanced planning at that point talking about what it is that you might have to offer us, what we, uh, what you're growing, maybe you have something extra in the field that you picked that day that wasn't going to be able to sold, be sold to uh, a, a restaurant that you thought or maybe wasn't going to make it to market in time. And then you could give us a call and we could negotiate those prices. And uh, we could also talk about what sort of production needs um, we might be able to meet at that point in time. Next. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about freshness, delivery, some harvest times, cleanliness upon arrival, processing, and uh, if you are a rancher, protein packaging. So first and foremost is our freshness and harvest delivery times. So working with uh, Scott Lester at, uh, uh, sorry, on Whitefish Stage Organic Farms, and uh, working with Keith at Mountain View Gardens, um, both these guys have done very well at being able to get a hold of me in the morning ask me what I need for that day or for the next few days, and then bring it to me either early in the morning or in the afternoon after they've done their pick in the morning, gotten it washed, put into a refrigerated facility, and then brought to me. So they both have been very, very good about communication. And one of the biggest things about making sure that it's uh, delivered on time and that's fresh is that the communication lines be open and be direct and be utilized at a fairly regular amount of, you know, regular time because we need to have some sort of continuity to be able to not really kind of have a guessing game on when things are going to arrive. We really need to understand because we need to have guarantees because we have guaranteed amount of people that we have to serve. When this produce is picked, we need to make sure that it comes into our facility already cleaned and free of debris from the field. I.e., if you're taking a box out of your truck and you're setting it on the ground in the field and the field is slightly damp in the morning, it picks up a little bit of dirt, sand, it gets on the side of the box, then you put the vegetables in it, and it still has a little bit of dirt and sand on it. And then we bring it into our facility. We're really just transferring a whole bunch of dirt around, which also has bacteria, which also has issues for our, our sinks, for our floors, causes us to have more labor. So what we're really looking to do is making sure that when you guys are buying or picking your produce, that you're bringing it into your facility, into a wash facility, taking care of any of the roots or any of the dirt that is on there, then placing it into a clean box, into a refrigerator, and then bringing it to us so that it is essentially free of any sort of outside influence that would otherwise come into our kitchen and create a contamination. Next, we're looking at any sort of processing, i.e. broccoli crowns versus florets. So a lot of times, if you guys have something out in the field and you're working in a small wash table or processing facility at your farm, and you can rem remove a little bit of the stems, that is a value-added process to us. We will pay a slightly higher price for that, if you guys are willing to remove some of the things that otherwise would be passing the labor on to us. And if you are a rancher, your protein packaging, super important that you follow all the USDA regulations and that you are both USDA inspected as well, each and every single time that in the kill plant as well as when it comes out. So everything needs to be cryoback, packed in the appropriate size that is what the federal mandate and then brought to us within that. And if you say it's refrigerated, please bring it to us refrigerated. If you tell me that it's frozen, then that's what my expectation is. And then it's also transported in a refrigerated truck. Next. Now we're going to kind of talk about some of the uh, required proofs for the USDA inspections for any of the meats. Production, um, how it's packaged and delivered to prevent any, from any adulteration, refrigeration required. Uh, types of liability insurance and underground water source. The first two bullet points on this slide we've already touched on quite a bit, so I'm going to kind of just breeze over those. Again, if you are a rancher, USDA inspection is something that is a, uh, a non-negotiable term and has to happen before we can see it, mainly because our populations are compromised and we just can't do much else without it. Uh, as in packaging and delivery, just make sure the boxes that are coming into us are clean, well-built, strong, not full of moisture, not full of dirt, and there's not a whole bunch of bugs in them. I understand that when we're growing with as few chemicals as possible, or if it's organic, that there's going to be some things that make it into our facility. 
all I ask is that it be the least amount possible and that you're bringing in the least amount of sand or dirt. Liability insurance is another thing that is not negotiable. Since we are a compromised facility that has a compromised guest, we are looking to make sure that you guys have at least a $5 million liability for your farm. Now, a lot of times for a small farmer, that is something that's very difficult or uh, cost prohibitive. In which case, there are a few uh, collectives out there, such as Western Montana Growers Cooperative, that will go ahead and provide that insurance and then you, in turn, can provide insurance to them underneath the umbrella of them as the parent company. And then when they bring that to us, they and then, in turn, are taking on the liability, in which case we are just fine with it. Um, as water source goes, there has been some instances in the past, and as organics grow outside of the United States, some of the regulations aren't necessarily the same as what they are here. And really what we're looking to do is make sure that the water source you use for your vegetables that comes to us are, is a proven water source from underground that is tested regularly so that there is no contamination problems that may occur from either E. coli or salmonella. Next. At this point, we're going to start talking a little bit about some of the marketing materials because the last few slides have been kind of dry and a little boring. What we really want to do is I want to be able to market you. So if you're going to sell me something, I want to be able to put it on an electronic sign put it in our cafeterias, in our dining rooms, in the hallways, on posters. I want to be able to tell people what they're getting, what this great food is, and what farm it's coming from. If I'm going to pay, or if we as an institution are going to pay a little bit of an elevated price to make certain that we're getting a quality ingredient, I most assuredly want to let my customer know, as well as us, as well as our client, who we're getting it from, why, and why is this the best, as well as the marketing material for it will be posted everywhere. And if you're selling to a grocery store at a farmer's market and you have the same sign up, you will see that people will have bought something from us within the cafes or within the, um, the guest rooms themselves. And they'll also be able to take that and show that they, that, well, they see it at the market itself and they put it together and they say, oh, I had this product over here. It was great. Maybe I'll give it a try over here and I'll buy it this way too. It does work, it's very helpful to all of us. So I really like to be able to see anything that, whenever you guys are showing up and talking to us, that you're bringing us any material that you might have already produced, that we then in turn, then in turn can uh, hand over to our marketers and they can really blow it up and make it look really nice and then we can turn it into our signage. Next. So last but not least, we're gonna talk a little bit about local foods and our future outlook. Processing needs, forward contracts, product development, relationship development. Over the past few years in Montana, I think I've been out here about eight years now, um, we've been able to start off with a small farm to institutions network and we've been able to get some farms and uh, Keith from Mountain View Gardens is one of the first guys that I ever met. Showed up at the door with a whole bunch of tomatoes and said, hey look, I'm selling these over at the good food store, would you guys like to try any? He came in, he introduced himself. I knew him by name within a week. He called me back the next time. He was very forward and he made sure that he had a good business relationship with me. And he's also made sure that he never failed on what he was going to deliver or what he was going to bring me. Everything was always quality and his reputation has followed him. Henceforth, I will always do business with Keith because of that. You know, he has built a great need. Scott Lester from uh, Whitefish Stage Organic Farms, same thing. Came through my back door with a whole bunch of lettuce and said, look, I have some quality ingredients here. You'd like to use them. I'm certain that we can grow your needs, and this is what we, we can do for you. And he has never, ever failed on that. When there has been extras and they've had stuff that they weren't able to sell or somebody wasn't able to fulfill a bargain, they were able to come to me and say, hey, I have a whole bunch of stuff, more than what you ordered. Would you be able to buy this and I'll give it to you at a discounted rate? These guys are doing exactly what they need to do to make sure that they can get into our doors and stay in our doors. When they do this, they also come and visit me in the fall. And we talk about what we're gonna grow for next year, building our forward contract, making sure that we are able to fulfill the amount of uh, food by weight and volume that we need to make our guests happy and make all the recipes that we require because we're feeding upwards of a couple thousand people a day. It's a fair amount of weight. I need to make sure that there is a guarantee that that is gonna come through my door. Um, we've been working with Western Montana Growers Cooperative, working on product development, making sure that there is some processing needs that they are doing for us at Mission Mountain, Food Enterprise Center in uh, Ronan. Those guys are taking some of the fine squashes that we grow in the state, 
processing them into cubed or into uh, purees, freezing them so I can keep buying that great product throughout the winter. Same thing with crushed tomatoes and so on and so forth with processed frozen vegetables. So in a nutshell, it takes a lot of people to come together to really make a relationship between the farm directly into the back door of our institutions. If you have any questions at the end of this webinar, I'm more than happy to ask them, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Seth. Uh, up next, we're going to hear from Keith Graham. So I'll hand it over to you, Keith. Thank you. Uh, we have been uh, in operation now for, uh, we will be starting our 12th year this summer. And I started out as a conventional farmer, uh, 2,000 acres, uh, 250 cow-calf operation, dragging machinery from one end of the farm to the other, and uh, got very tired of that. The one thing that I did do in all of this is uh, we started to go more to cattle and doing it a lot more manageable. Uh, the thing that gives me the biggest kick is how much money I can make on a certain amount of land. As for instance, uh, we started uh, 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 our cattle raising in uh, high, high densities and uh, we were running 100 and, uh, 120 cow-calf pairs on 160 acres. And uh, that was really fun to see. But uh, for myself, um, I'd had enough of farming and we decided to retire and uh, somebody came along and offered us a bunch of money for it and I took it and uh, uh, the rest is history as they would say until I retired and decided I didn't like being retired. Uh, my background as a kid, uh, I was in 4-H uh, all my life, I was in a 4-H garden club and uh, I love growing vegetables. Uh, we'll go to the next picture, please. Um, and so putting all of that together, we decided that I didn't want to have a big garden outside, so we started, we put up uh, three greenhouses, 20 feet wide by 100 feet long. And we started growing lettuce and tomatoes. And uh, found that the, the market didn't allow us to, produce lettuce because we were competing with uh, Southern California, but the tomato market was really there. Uh, we started going to some stores to start off with to see if they might be interested in our tomatoes. Uh, and the biggest thing that we found was that uh, they want a consistent supply of tomatoes uh, every week. They don't want 10 this week and 30 next week. They want it steady. So uh, it was really hard to get into the into the grocery stores and whatnot. And uh, so then the next thing we did is we started off at the farmer's market. And that was what gave us the kick. Uh, I truly believe in farmer's markets. Uh, it got our name out. All of a sudden, uh, people started asking for our tomatoes in the grocery stores. And then I had to grocery stores calling me and uh, that is kind of where it led to let us be into the school system uh, led us to be in with in the hospital um, and that's where we met Seth then and, and that went along uh, next please um, recruiting uh, our staff Staff is uh, one of the uh, toughest things that we deal with because uh, uh, we have to be able to guarantee somebody that wants a, a job, uh, they're looking for jobs year round. Well, we employ uh, uh, seven people year round um, and then we go up to close to 14 people uh, when things start picking up as we are right now. Um, are building a relationship with salespeople. Uh, our product, we, we've, we just have a very high standard of uh, uh, producing. Uh, you can go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, that when we uh, call out our, our tomatoes, 
that go to the store are absolutely the best that we can produce. Um, pricing them, we have learned that uh, um, the stores are willing to pay more money for a top quality, locally grown product. And uh, even the Mrs. Consumer is willing to pay top dollar for a good quality product. And uh, over the years, we've, we've seen that day in, day out. Uh, one of the things that we are not, we are not certified organic, but uh, all of our practices are organic, if you need to use that word. Um, the biggest thing that we have found, and that was uh, through it all, is that uh, Mrs. Consumer, she thinks that organic means that it's not, there's no herbicides or pesticides used on in your plant. Being in the greenhouse, uh, we can't do that uh, because we use uh, uh, bumblebees, we use uh, different sorts of bugs to take care of our predator bugs. And uh, anyway, that all works out for us. Uh, it's to the point now in the, in the grocery stores that uh, they build end caps to uh, market our stuff and uh, uh, it's, it's, for me it's very humbling to go into a grocery store and see that and uh, that they think enough of the product that we're producing and that's one of the rewards of what we're doing. Um, our seconds, we'll go to the next uh, please. Um, our seconds were uh, usually can go to somebody like uh, Seth at the hospital. Uh, we still have a high grading system for them. They'll just have a mark on it from where they were had grown. There's never any damage or rot or anything like that on it. That goes to the compost pile. But uh, uh, what we call our thirds go to a, a processor that makes salsa out of it. And uh, so we've been very blessed to be able to have a market for everything that we produce. Uh, there is the odd time that we do have an abundance of, and I'm able to go to people like Seth and say, uh, do you have extra room? Uh, we've got an extra amount of this or whatever, and uh, he can usually process it. We work out a deal and it's a done thing and uh, nothing gets wasted. Uh, if there's some extra extra, uh, we have we do support our local food bank, and uh, they are very appreciative at that end as well. Next, the last thing. This is not for everybody. Um, when we started this project, uh, I had no idea. I thought that bigger was going to be better. Bigger is not necessarily better. I wish we'd have stayed a small operation and that we used the farmer's markets to sell everything. Uh, uh, this has turned into a seven day a week job, 10 months of the year or more. You're tied to alarms and everything else. And uh, not that I'm not, I'm, I don't mind the work. I enjoy it. Uh, it's better than being retired for me. Um, the next thing, though, to get into something like this is it's not cheap. Uh, for every uh, acre of greenhouse that you put up so that you can grow at least 8 to 10, and we're trying to grow 12 months of the year here this year, uh, it'll cost you between a million and a million and a half dollars an acre for your greenhouse. As for myself, if you have any questions afterwards, I'm more than happy to take them. And uh, you've heard enough from me. I'll let Scott uh, take over from there and he can talk about his little farm. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Uh, this is Scott Lester, uh, owner operator of White Prestige Organic Farms um, on, in Kalispell. Uh, my wife and I, um, my wife and I started the farm and, and she, I, I help her with the business side today. She actually is the principal farmer and does all the farming operations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we started 
relatively recently, 2016, on a 65-acre retired seed potato farm uh, next to Kalispell. The uh, land was slated to be developed into a subdivision, and we actually bought it um, out kind of from underneath the, the developer. Uh, from the owners that didn't want to see their their family's legacy become a subdivision, and we were able to, um, you know, we we're originally thinking we would just live on the farm, but we wanted to find a use for it uh, to keep from needing to um, subdivide it and sell it off, and um, landed on the idea that um, you know there needed to be more local uh, supplies of food. Uh, when so much of uh, the food is coming uh, across the continent um, to feed our local population. Um, we, we're right on city limits. Uh, we have easy access to the market. The, the land had not been in production for 25 years, so it could be certified organic right away. Um, and uh, we like the idea that um, we could create jobs, uh, kind of like Keith. Uh, we might have started out smaller uh, initially, but we wanted to create jobs and we wanted to have the economies of scale to really use the land and 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 have full-time employees. Um, our background um, is business consulting. My wife is an accountant. Uh, she grew up uh, gardening, a uh, large garden. She grew up relatively uh, modest means. And so um, the family fed themselves. And so she had that experience, but uh, we brought our business skills to the table and learned how to farm. Um, we hired good people. We hired an extraordinary farmer our first year that we worked with that helped us uh, get things going and have since taken over the farming operations. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, why certified organic? Well, we recognize that people want um, a relationship with their food producer that they can trust. We felt like uh, certified organic was one way to say, hey, uh, you can trust the food here. Um, we didn't have to make any changes to get certified organic um, because the land was already in organic production. Um, we were willing to prove that our production was organic. Um, it's come at, it comes at a cost. There's an organic tax that you have to pay basically um, with the Department of Agriculture uh, it's 2% of your sales, and it's a hefty tax when you think about um, the profit margins being so low um, in this in this uh, industry um, that non-organic producers don't have to pay that. Um, but we've elected to go ahead and um, both be certified and follow uh, organic practices. Um, it allows us to get into some places where we couldn't get in. Uh, there are some places that require an organic certification in order to buy. Um, and we, we decided to um, follow organic practices primarily um, on our land because we live here and uh, we want it to be safe for our kids and for ourselves. And we think that it's more sustainable uh, just in terms of soil health to, to have organic practices. Um, the number one reason we're organic is a picture of my, my two-year-old here who's chewing on a radish that he picked and didn't wash uh, coming out of the ground. And, um, you know, another thing that Seth touched on was well water. Uh, we're well water irrigated, well water washed, and that's really important because we don't introduce um, contaminants into our uh, fields either uh, when we're irrigating or when we're washing. And that's a big deal. It, it means that it's safe uh, to, you know, take the food out of the ground and, and wash the dirt off and eat it. Next slide, please. Um, so what was our strategy? Our strategy was to take market share away from non-local producers by only serving customers in the local market. So while organic was is part of our name, our strategy is really just local. Uh, we don't sell anything that doesn't get sold local. And like Keith, we sell everything that we can grow locally or have um, up in the last few years sold everything that we can grow. And we're blessed to say that. Um, we It allows for you know a, a farm to table value proposition for the consumer. So they're eating something hyper fresh, hyper local. Uh, we harvest to order every morning. Um, so we don't put food in the walk-in and let it sit there for days and hope to find a market for it. It doesn't get picked until we've got a home for it. Um, we 
we work with our wholesale customers and give them marketing materials so that they can play the um, we support local card and and they can build the value of the, the hyper fresh uh, food that we bring. Um, we uh, because we only deliver locally, you know, we are, you know we take our orders, harvest, and deliver all on the same day. It's our one differentiator from all the organic produce coming out of uh, California, Oregon, and Mexico. Um, and um, and it allows for a much greater efficiency uh, on our farm. We have to make up for um, our short growing season by being more efficient. Um, and our our relative size, not being a mass producer of any one crop, um, by being just very efficient with everything we do grow. So the name of the game is unique quality and unique efficiency. Next slide, please. So customers that really fit for us are local institutions large enough to, to basically cover the delivery fee expected by the industry and large enough to do kind of repeated um, consistent orders so we can grow to order for them so that we can um, plan around what their needs are going to be and um, so we can um, you know kind of have a home for for seeds that haven't been planted yet um, and we we do this we meet with Seth and we talk to him about what his, his needs are um, we look closely at what he bought you know the previous year and tailor our planting accordingly to kind of fit that um, and then you know we we do everything we can to maintain a good relationship with our customers because at the end of the day it's it's people that we're dealing with and we really are, are you know it's our job to help make them better at their jobs so you know whatever they need um you know special deals special pricing um marketing materials we we really try to accommodate that so that it makes sense for them to continue to work with us um GSA customers have, have proven to be a really good fit for us. Um, we're able to, um, you know, grow to order for that customer base as well. And as a result, just not have very much waste um, on the farm altogether. And, and avoiding waste is a big deal on a vegetable farm because you're, um, you've got so much money tied up in every head of lettuce and every uh, bunch of broccoli that um, if, if it doesn't get sold, it costs you your gross margin on four or five heads that you did sell. So next, please. So um, customers that we found didn't fit for us were farmers markets. We found that they work good for owner operators. For us, when we by the time we paid folks to wash, pack, um, deliver, set up, um, sell, tear down, and then throw away what was left over. Um, we found that we were on good days breaking even at the farmers markets and on bad days losing uh, lots of money and it was just costing us to go there. Um, what we found was that farmers markets really work really good for owner operators, um, but not so good if you've got um, full time paid employees that are going. And we, um, similar to Keith, kind of have. Um, we have seven or so employees on the shoulder season and up to 14 at peak and um, and they're all paid and they all get um, workers comp. And, and so um, every everything we do has to, um, it has to make sense from a, you know, paying employees to go do it standpoint, um, even with us working on the farm um, or, or it just doesn't, it's not sustainable long-term. Um, another customer, other customers that didn't fit were really small wholesale buyers, small grocery stores, um, small um, restaurants would, you know, they would they'd do small orders to kind of demonstrate, you know, their support and, and would want to buy some, but just either didn't have the demand or were buying from too many or, um, and what we found was, is, you know, with the free delivery, it was costing us more money than we were making. So we try to build relationships with small buyers, but uh, you know, if, if the orders never grew beyond a certain point, we just have to not go back next year because it just didn't make sense to keep doing it. Next slide, please. 
So relationships with hotel customers uh, really, you know, I touched on this earlier, really involves us putting ourselves in their shoes. It's the people. we got to get to know them in their business. We're going to make it easy for them to buy. We're going to make it fun for them to buy. Um, let them in on special items and deals and things that pop up. Um, try to keep them informed on what's going on on the farm so they can weave that into their menus. Um, and we try to do things for them that only local producers can do, which is um, make sure that stuff that's sitting in their walk-in stays fresh or it gets replaced. Um, keep an eye on um, their supplies and make sure we're not oversupplying or undersupplying in any category. Um, we've been willing to take stuff back that's spoiled on their shelves. So it's simply because we wanted our stuff and our brand to look fresh on their shelves. And so they're not having the food waste costs that they might otherwise have. Um, and then of course, instant delivery, you know, the same day delivery is a big uh, proposition for local customers. Um, you know, we, we, as we work with all of our customers, we found that it's better to get an existing customer to buy more than to go get a new customer. And it makes a lot more sense for both their institution and for us as well. It, it represents kind of a doubling down on, on the relationship um, where they're, they're trying to build um, an image with their customer base as having used locally sourced products. And it allows us to, to market them more through our social media and, and through our marketing as, as a purveyor um, or as a buyer from our farm. And, um, and then, of course, market um, directly to their folks that they're, they're buying locally and buying fresher food. Next slide. Uh, so some of the tools that we've used for marketing. Um, so we we um, have a website, uh, we've got posters, we've got social media marketing um, that we're active in kind of almost year round. Um, even though our, our farm is only in production six months a year, we're engaging with the consumer almost 12 months a year um, with between marketing our CSA and, and the value of our farm and our fall events and the other things that we have going on that are basically there to, to build relationships with end users and consumers um, so that they know and trust our brand. Um, so we help um, wholesale customers with their marketing events. We've attended multiple marketing events with multiple different wholesale customers. Um, we've generated custom posters and banners and flyers and ads for all of our wholesale customers to use. Any, anything from stickers for menus and restaurants to um, flyers and posters for um, kiosks to attending a marketing event with a full uh, complement of uh, vegetables. Uh, for our, our uh, wholesale customers. Um, we see it as our job to build a strong local brand so that that brand is valuable to our, not just retail, but wholesale customers. Um, and one thing that you know I, I would like to point out is that it takes a lot of extra work for a wholesale customer to buy from a local producer. They can get all of their produce from you know one, one seller year round if they want and have it all trucked in. Um, so for them to get more granular in their ordering and their menu planning, it's a lot of extra work. And we recognize that and try to go above and beyond to make it really easy for them to work with us, but also to give them value added things that they can do along with buying from us. So it's not just about buying produce. It's about, um, you know, the whole story of where the food came from and then being able to impart that on to their customers. Um, because at the end of the day, if the, cust if the wholesale buyer isn't willing to do the extra work, like Seth has been willing to do, um, then we don't have a customer. Um, and we've had plenty that have just kind of, you know, either said through their actions or said directly, this is just a lot more time and a lot more work that I'm willing to put into um, buying my, my produce. Next slide, please. So lessons learned. Um, you know, we've learned uh, to disengage with tough customers in markets that don't, don't pencil. Um, we've learned to double down with good customers. Um, um, we've learned that it's a moving marketplace and you can't rest on your laurels. Um, you know, the old expression, if you're standing still, you're actually running backwards, applies to this industry. 
Um, 10 years ago, being organic was a differentiator. Today, it, it barely means anything um, in terms of differentiation. Um, local is the differentiator today. Um, we've got to be really good at growing and, and really good at producing a, a great product. And it's got to be clean and it's got to be prepped the way our customers are asking for it. But we have to be just as good at marketing and we have to be good at building a brand and we have to be good at um, communicating with the local population and, and telling a story that's engaging and interesting. Um, the Californians and the Mexicans have a year round growing season and uh, we're competing with that growing season. So, um, you know, we're in the growing food people um, can trust and growing food that people knew where it came from business. And I think that's my last slide. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Scott. And uh, thanks to Keith and Seth as well. And it's great to hear from folks that are uh, making these relationships work in the field and, and to hear uh, both sides uh, and the good and the bad. So I appreciate your all's time on this webinar. Um, we will have time for questions shortly. I want to take about five minutes to share with all of you in attendance about a program here in Montana that's been opening the door up for institutional sales for our specialty crop producers. Um, next slide. The Montana Harvest of the Month program showcases Montana grown foods in Montana schools, institutions, and communities. Each month, the participating sites will focus on one locally grown item by serving it in a meal or a snack or an a la carte option and displaying or distributing the Harvest of the Month materials. Additionally, the schools that participate will offer taste tests to students and do educational lessons and activities. Uh, Montana Harvest of the Month has been a great way to launch or grow a farm to cafeteria program as it provides an easy and attractive framework to follow and ready to use materials. So those participating sites get a free packet of these materials as well as guides, additional resources and training. Uh, next slide. Harvest of the Month has been um, a collaborative statewide program. It's been made possible by uh, a lot of different partners and the funders that you see here and, and we're grateful for that support. Next. Uh, this is a map of all of the institutions that are participating in Harvest of the Month currently. Right now there's over 130 K through 12 schools that are registered with four pilot healthcare sites and eight pilot preschools. Um, the school sites can register at no charge at any time during the school year. Uh, next slide. So each month features a different Montana grown or raised food and the, the calendar that we put together makes it easier to find local foods, to plan ahead, secure future orders, you know, especially with the winter storage crops like beets and, and carrots. Um, and in the next couple of years, we're going to be adding some new, new items and changing the calendar so that we can continue to feature new foods. You can see dairy and dry beans on, on the agenda for, for the upcoming year. Next slide. So all of the schools and, and programs that are participating in Harvest of the Month have four main responsibilities. The first one is to form a team, um, and that's uh, a diverse team. In, in some cases, it's marketing staff and administration, and uh, you know, in schools, they always involve teachers, food service staff, uh, sometimes producers, other NGO support organizations can be part of that team. Then each site has to showcase that Harvest of the Month item using Montana grown foods, of course, at least once during that month in a meal, a snack, a la carte item, educational activities, and, and taste tests. Uh, additionally, the school, the registered sites must use the provided materials and display them in, in a visible location um, and then participate in evaluation as well. Next. So our team is here to help these registered sites and anyone that's interested in, in selling to them. Um, we provide the participating sites uh, with a mailed packet, electronic versions of all these materials, um, different guides on, on buying local. We conduct in-person and webinar trainings. Um, and of course, we're always available to answer questions for them. Next. So what's the opportunity for producers here? Uh, Harvest of the Month, as I said before, is 
an, an opportunity, a program, a tool that opens up doors to institutional sales. Um, you know, it uh, allows for purchasing and showcasing one item each month, but uh, where it goes from there is all up to the relationship that you as the producer build with that institution. Um, we've seen great successes with this over the past three years since it's been in schools and, and hence we're, we're doing the expansion into other um, other markets as well. So selling to schools, as has been mentioned, does give um, an opportunity to, to market seconds uh, with with schools. There's uh, far, you know farm field trips, opportunities to engage with the kids, um, to work with distributors that those schools might already be familiar with. Um, uh, also, as um, all three of the presenters before me mentioned, you know, including your promotional materials, having, uh, getting your name and, and your farm out there to the the families that are in attendance or that are utilizing that institution, um, and it can be a springboard into forward contracting as you have a a, a calendar a full year ahead that shows what the institution is going to be purchasing in what months. Next slide. I mentioned a little bit about farm field trips, but uh, as a as a producer, um, you've got a lot of, of great information and in schools in particular, uh, kids need that experience that, that brings them full circle back to where their food comes from and uh, taking the opportunity to go in and, and to talk to students about what you do. Um, or maybe even bringing a, a taste test in, bringing samples um, to share with the with the kids and, and talk about your process and raising, growing, processing, making food. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned that this program has been expanding out of um, the school realm, and we're now piloting in healthcare institutions, preschools. And uh, also there's a couple of food banks that are using some of these materials as well as grocery stores. Um, you know, the intent is, is bringing the conversation about local seasonally available produce to the home place, uh, building the uh, consumer knowledge of what we have available to us. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think of Montana and they think that it's just beef, barley, and wheat, but this state has uh, so much more. Um, as is evidenced by the, the the previous two growers that spoke with us. Um, so next slide. Here are a few more resources relating to some of the topics that were covered today. Uh, we recently updated the Farm to Cafeteria Manual for Montana, and uh, you can find that at this link or at farmtocafeteria.ncat.org. Um, we spoke a little bit on this webinar about um, about employees and hiring uh, FarmLink Montana and, the, and there are farm links in other parts of the country as well but uh, FarmLink Montana offers a great resource for uh, beginning farmers and ranchers that are looking for land as well as finding uh, help for your farm whether it's paid or unpaid uh, type of internships or hiring. Uh, ATRA similarly uh, operates a, a clearinghouse of, for information for producers, everything relating from uh, integrated pest management to intensive livestock grazing practices. You can always call and talk to an ATRA specialist or uh, send us an email or, or use the chat window on the website if you've got a question. Um, and that's also where you can find this webinar and many others posted uh, after the close of this session. And coming up in Montana, here early early next month, uh, there are a few workshops done by a partner of ours, Lake County Community Development, that will be on marketing on a small budget. So if you'd like more information or to register for one of those, you can call the number that you see here. Uh, next slide. So thank you all so much for your attention during this webinar, and we'll use our remaining time to answer any questions that have come up. Uh, remember, you can type any questions that you might have in the question field that you see on your screen. So first question that I have, I think we'll go to Seth. Are the, the question is, are the food safety guidelines that were covered internal policies or are there explicit requirements from the inspection agency? 
who inspects hospital food service? Uh, in that question, who inspects hospital food service? Um, we, as Thomas Cuisine Management, have our own specific guidelines that we manage within that we've taken uh, at, collectively from around the country and then created our own system within which we operate. Um, the $5 million liability covers water source and covers contamination within any sort of uh, um, organic material, such as you know anything that is either grown or raised in a natural fashion. So uh, those are just simply put together by ourselves. And then the hospital themselves, we have a, a, a legal team that has gone through what our regulations are. They have gone against the national average and okayed them. And so they sign on the dotted line as per our contract. Awesome. Thanks, Seth. Uh, this is a question for, uh, let's say, Scott first, and then Keith, if you've got anything to add. Is the 2% of gross that you referred to related to organic certification, or is it an additional cost? Uh, it's just relating to certification. Uh, additional cost is um, more of a fixed cost. We spend about or five thousand dollars a year on organic um, manure-based fertilizer. We could probably, if we were using a conventional fertilizer, cut that down um, by more than half because um, we just get the chemical that we're, we we would need instead of the um, you know the, um, the the organic fertilizer, which is not as potent and a lot more expensive. Um, I guess finally, in terms of cost, a huge portion of our labor cost is on weed control. Huge portion. Even though we've got machines that we use to, to make it faster and more efficient, um, we spend uh, in the tens of thousands of dollars a year on labor uh, dealing with uh, non-desirable non plants that grow around the target plant. So that's that's our biggest organic cost. Um, on our kind of farm, I don't think that we could really spray uh, for weeds. So it's kind of a moot point. Um, we'd be able to spray a little bit, but not not to the full extent. Um, but it would eliminate that that enormous labor cost. And Scott, speaking about mechanization for weed control, do you have other mechanization on your farm? Yeah, well, we have um, we have you know a, a cultivating uh, machine which is pulled over the rows multiple times um, a season, you know, on every row. Uh, it's set for each row and what's growing there. Um, it's basically there to set up in a way to not damage the existing plants, and um, and it's set up in a way that um, will will take out the baby uh, weeds. Uh, we also have a flame weeder that we flame um, flame the the rows right after they've been tilled before they're planted that we we run that that basically kills all the seeds and then um, the weed seeds that are on the surface and then you could plant into that stale surface and not have too many weeds sprouting thereafter. Gotcha. Um, for Keith, have prices been a barrier for other institutions? Do you sell to other institutions beside the ho besides the hospital, or have you tried that? Yeah, no, we're in uh, we're in the, all the local school districts uh, here in uh, Kalispell. We're also in the University of Montana, and uh, the school system in Montana or in Missoula as well. Um, and uh, we've been in a few other hospitals, and, and that's an area that we're going to uh, start targeting a little bit more now. Uh, uh, we hope to. So. so the schools have pretty tight budgets. Um, how, how do they afford a, a premium priced product? Sometimes, uh, we negotiate with, like the university in Missoula, uh, they, they are a very good client of ours. And uh, because of the volume that they take, uh, uh, we 
we do negotiate the price down on uh, on cucumbers. Um, so far, uh, the biggest thing that they have found in the school system is that uh, they want fresh produce, bar nothing, and uh, uh, they have learned that the taste and the quality is is worth it for the kids. That's just been a uh, I hear that every every year. No, uh, the the price uh, is more than worth paying for. For uh, Scott and Keith both, uh, can you talk about how much liability insurance you carry? Um, and there is a question from someone that lives in the Flathead about known or recommended resources for discounts on liability insurance for small farmers. I don't know if you have any knowledge of that. Scott, you want to go after it first? Sure. Um, so uh, I would have to check with my wife because she actually handles that piece of it. But I can tell you that um, you we haven't found anything specialized for our industry. Um, the problem with the small farming industry is that um, we there's just not a lot of um, you know, a lot of a lot of the industry is targeting either large farms um, or you know, I guess just large markets. And the small market farm industry is not really um, significant enough to have you know tailored insurance products you know made for it. So I'm, I'm fairly certain we have a standard liability policy that meets the requirements of our wholesale buyers. My wife handled um, procuring and providing those. Um, those to our customers. I'm not sure exactly how much we carry. How about for you, Keith? Um, well, I'm going to put a plug for Hartford Insurance. That's who we've been using for a number of years. That uh, uh, and and we carry uh, up to an eight million dollar liability insurance. Uh, we have some of our stores that we sell to. Uh, they demand uh, uh, up to that, and uh, and because of the the volume that they do, we carry it. Um, so, uh, but we have been, uh, we've been given a name of a company um, based out of New York City that uh, we've been doing a little, a little work with that we might be able to get it a little bit cheaper, but uh, it's, it's such a small percentage of the dollars spent uh, um, It'll have to be really a good deal to change because we've been very satisfied with uh, not that we've ever had a claim against us or anything, but uh, um, everything has been very good. All right, here's a question for Scott. Can you provide an estimate, possibly a percentage of gross sales, of how you spend how much you spend on marketing for wholesale events and similar activities that are separate from new sales generation? Oh, um, you know, that's a tough question um, because it, it's so bundled together in our minds. Um, what we're doing, it, it's really not, um, we're, you know, we're not necessarily marketing for new sales generation and then not, um, and not, you know, seeing that is also building our brand for wholesale um, sales as well. Um, but I, I can say that um, our overall marketing is probably somewhere around 5% of sales total, which um, I think a lot of farmers would choke on that. But like I said earlier, I think that that's, uh, that's necessary um, for us. Awesome, thanks. And another question, how is the turnover rate for larger wholesale customers versus for small or for CSA customers? And that one is for you as well, Scott. I'm sorry, you cut out there. Can, can you restate that? Yeah, certainly. 
how is the turnover rate for larger wholesale customers versus small wholesale customers or CSA customers? Um, I would say that our turnover rate for wholesale customers has been zero. We have yet to turn over um, a wholesale customer that we really got established with. Now we've had wholesale customers uh, that have um, turned over in terms of you know, they just never really ordered much from us to start out with. And so we um, we ended up just kind of not continuing that relationship or not you know continuing to try to sell to that customer. Um, but with our, our, our customers that we've really gotten established with, we haven't lost any uh, knock on wood. Um, with with CSA customers, it's a lot higher. Um, it's looking like this year we're going to have around a 60% retention rate of CSA members. So we have to replace about 40%, which is typical for CSAs of our size. Thank you. Well, we are just past the top of the hour, and that is all the time we have. Um, this webinar will be posted in the next few days on the ATRA website at www.atra.ncat.org. And as I said, we'll get back to you about any questions that you had that weren't answered during the webinar. Uh, I want to remind you, once again, please take just a minute to complete the survey that you'll see on your screen immediately after we close here. Um, we really appreciate your feedback. And thank you so much to all our, uh, all our presenters and panelists, and, and thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar.